So it is my great pleasure to introduce now uh, Dr. Peter De Jager. Uh, Peter uh, is a staff cardiovascular anesthesiologist in our institution at the Q QE2 uh, Hospital in Halifax, as assistant professor of anesthesiology at Dalhousie University. He is a South African trained anesthesiologist who completed a fellowship in cardiovascular anesthesiology and critical care at the Toronto General Hospital. He will be joining us with the uh, presentation of uh, 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 descending our pathologies, and uh, we will be uh, uh, using a pre-recorded uh, lecture. But he is online and ready to jump into if necessary. His uh, internet connection may not be great because he's in uh, another event in in one of the uh, uh, cities around the province. Thank you very much. You can go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter De Jager. I'm an anesthesiologist at Dalhousie University in Halifax, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk today on pathologies of the descending aorta, co-optation, aneurysms, and dissections. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk will be to describe an integrated approach to the evaluation of descending aortic disease, outline treatment options available for coarctation, dissection and aneurysms, and describe how TEE can be used to support endovascular and catheter-based interventions. Causes of descending aortic disease can broadly be categorized into hereditable thoracic aortic disease, congenital diseases, and acquired. When evaluating diseases of the descending aorta, certain goals should be kept in mind. The first one is to have a high index of suspicion. Often diseases are asymptomatic, and if they are symptomatic, they can present in a broad array of different signs and symptoms. Secondly, it is important to identify complicated and high-risk features and finally, it is important to quantify the comorbid state and the overall surgical risk. There are three overarching modalities. First, clinical. Second, imaging. And the final component of an evaluation is to engage in multidisciplinary and shared decision making. Symptomatic aortic disease can broadly be categorized into compressive symptoms and malperfusion syndromes. Computed tomography is the mod most widely available and used modality to image diseases of the descending aorta. It allows for rapid assessment and it has high sensitivity and specificity. High resolution 3D data sets allow um, very accurate assessment of the pathology as well as involvement of branch vessels um, and associated potential complications like hemopericardium and thorax. Unfortunately, it's associated with radiation exposure as well as the potential for contrast nephropathy. MRI has better temporal resolution, allows for valvular and ventricular function. Assessment has no radiation. However, longer acquisition times and less availability makes this a less favorable modality. Transthoracic and transesophageal echo provides excellent temporal and spatial resolution. It's available, portable, and allows for real-time assessment of ventricular and valvular function. There's no radiation as well. Um, however, with particularly with TEE, there's limited ability to um, evaluate the aortic arch. Intravascular ultrasound has high resolution and allows for intraluminal imaging to guide endovascular management. Um, in the setting of using fluoroscopy, this allows for potential less need for um, exposure to contrast and radiation. However, it's expensive and it's not that widely available. Evaluation of the of aortic disease is concluded by shared decision making as well as multidisciplinary aortic teams. It's important um, to engage a patient um, as well as other members of the team to come up with an appropriate management plan, especially for complicated disease. Coarctation of the aorta commonly occurs at the ductus arteriosus level. However, many anatomic variants exist. Narrowing 
at the aortic isthmus results in hypertension. However, hypertension is also as a result of reduced compliance of the aorta as well as endothelial dysfunction and activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It is associated with other congenital abnormalities, most notably bicuspid aortic valves up to 75% association. It is quite common with a 4 per 10,000 live birth incidence and presents um, at different stages of life depending on severity. Males are slightly more affected than females. It is also associated with the classic Schoen's complex which consists of coarctation, subaortic membrane, parachute mitral valve and supravalvular mitral ring. So evaluation of coarctation depends on clinical features as well as quantifying the severity of the disease. Clinically, it's important to establish uh, the severity in terms of sim symptomatology as well as um, associated lesions and potential complications. Typically, mild disease presents in, in adolescents and adults with upper limb hypertension, radiofemoral delay due to uh, the development of collaterals for distal blood supply, claudication, a continuous murmur, and limited exercise capacity. In terms of the severity um, or significant coarctation, depends on the following criteria. Having upper extremity hypertension or evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy and a difference between your upper and your lower limb blood pressure of more than 20, 20 millimeters of mercury or a catheter or Doppler-based um, blood pressure difference of more than 10 in the setting of decreased left ventricular function or significant um, collateral blood supply. This is a chest x-ray of a young adult showing the classic figure 3 sign due to the abnormal contour of the aorta as well as notching of the ribs due to collateral blood supply. So a 22-year-old male presented to our institution with a history of repeated episodes of dizziness and sync syncope and presyncope while playing soccer. He was um, found to be hypertensive and a murmur was found on precordial examination. He had no other significant medical history. A transthoracic echo showed a bicuspid aortic valve with moderate to severe AI as well as coarctation of the aorta with a gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury. This is a CT showing a, um, a coarctation just distal to the takeoff of the left subclavian artery. This is his transthoracic echo showing the aortic arch and the takeoff of the left subclavian artery and just distal to that we can see turbulent flow. Um, and putting pulse wave Doppler through that area, they found a gradient on this image of 50 to 55 millimeters of mercury. Um, intraoperatively, this is his TEE. It shows a dilated left ventricle with no no low normal ejection fraction. Um, there's a false tendon present. Um, he has a Sievers type naught bicuspid aortic valve and scanning up his aorta from the stomach um, to the left subclavian. There's a narrowing there, and um, this is the left subclavian that we can see over there. Um, putting that area into a, a long axis view, we see turbulent flow across that um, coarctation point. Management of coarctation includes medical, catheter-based interventions, as well as surgical. Medical intervention allows for permissive upper extremity hypertension. Catheter-based interventions is really the first line management in adults and re -coarctation. It allows for excellent hemodynamic results with a low complication rate in the early follow-up period. However, there is a high, higher incidence of re-intervention rate, up to 21% at 60 months. There's also the potential for aneurysm formation as well as um, complications with a stent, such as stent fracture. Surgical intervention is primarily, um, w primarily aimed at uh, children and patients with more complicated um, disease or associated um, congenital uh, heart disease. Our patient underwent 
a catheter-based intervention in our hybrid OR. Here we can see a catheter being advanced um, into the aortic arch, both under fluoroscopy as well as transesophageal echo with the stent appropriately placed across the coarctation point. Um, here the stent is being deployed and finally the stent is completely deployed at this point. On follow-up two years later, our patient was asymptomatic um, and uh, he had a gradient of 14 millimeters of mercury across the CP stent. 40% of thoracic aneurysms involve the descending thoracic aorta. Most patients are asymptomatic on presentation. The key principle that underlines the management of these patients is the law of Laplace, which shows the relationship between the tension and the pressure and radius. Pressure and DPDT are medically manage managed. However, when a radius threshold is reached, surgery is the only option to mitigate risk of aortic complication. The overarching goal in the management of these patients is to reduce the risk of aortic complication. The question is when and how to intervene. At a diameter of 6 cm, the descending thoracic aortic aneurysm reaches a tipping point where the risk of complications increase exponentially. However, one always has to seek high risk features that may justify early intervention. These include rapid aortic growth of more than 0.5 cm per year, symptomatic aneurysms, associated connective tissue disorders or hereditable thoracic aortic diseases, saccular morphology, female sex, and infected aneurysms. How can either be done through endovascular or open? So open repair provides a more definitive outcome However, it's associated with higher perioperative risk. Endovascular um, interventions require anatomy suitable to the deployment of the stent, particularly in terms of access, as well as the availability of an appropriate landing zone. And se the second thing to consider with endovascular repair is that there's an increased incidence of uh, re-intervention rates. There are no RCTs comparing endovascular versus open repair. A 58-year-old female had an ascending aorta and hemi-arch repair eight months ago. Uh, she has a background history of giant cell aortitis, dyslipidemia, and scoliosis. On post-operative visit and imaging, she was found to have a rapid enlargement of her mid-descending thoracic aorta. Her CT scan showed a crawford extent to thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Her intraoperative transesophageal echo showed reduced biventricular function. Scanning up her aorta from the stomach, we see an aneurysmal descending thoracic aorta with multiple layered hematoma as well as atherosclerotic disease. There are multiple cannulation strategies for these patients. Our patient underwent a left thoracotomy in the lateral position. Um, this is her long femoral uh, cannula, um, which is appropriately placed with the tip in the superior vena cava. Um, for arterial access, uh, the surgeons cannulated her left subclavian artery with a chimney graft. A devastating complication of these procedures is spinal cord ischemia, particularly in, in the context of patients presenting with asymptomatic disease. The pooled estimate from published literature um, of permanent spinal cord ischemia is estimated at 4.5%, with a 5.7% incidence in open repair and 3.9% for endovascular repair. Crawford extent 2 and 3 are highest risk. Guidelines recommend that um, CSF drainage and extensive TAAA um, extent 1 and 2 significantly reduces spinal cord ischemia. Delayed spinal cord ischemia can occur up to two weeks post-surgery, and in these settings, continuous spinal fluid drainage is less effective in preventing um, latent 
spinal cord ischemia. Our patient unfortunately developed spinal cord ischemia on day seven post-op in the setting of a splenic bleed and associated hypertension and anemia. Early recognition and aggressive management can improve outcomes, with the key strategy being maximizing perfusion oxygenation to the spinal cord. AKI is also relatively common, with 2-5% to of these patients requiring hemodialysis post-operatively. Local organ hypothermia using cold crystalloid or blood-based perfusate um, can potentially prevent um, the incidence or reduce the incidence of AKI. A 54-year-old male presented at a peripheral hospital with flank pain. He then subsequently developed hemodynamic instability and a CT showed a type B dissection. Other than atrial fibrillation, he was otherwise well. This is a CT scan showing a type B310 dissection with fluid in the left hemithorax. His intraoperative echo showed normal biventricular function. He has a normal tricuspid aortic valve um, that is functioning well. Scanning up his aorta, we see a dissection. Um, the true lumen being posterior, smaller, expanding during systole and collapsing during diastole. We also see a large effusion in the left pleural space. Traditionally, type B e dissection was treated with open repair. However, endovascular therapy has largely supplanted open repair. The endovascular approach is associated with lower morbidity and mortality rates. Optimal medical management is associated with 30-day mortality rate of 10% and a mid-term mortality rate of approximately 30%. The ADSORB and INSTEAD trials both showed a lower mortality and morbidity compared to medical management alone. There has been no randomized controlled trials evaluating the efficacy of endovascular repair relative to open repair. This treatment algorithm was published by the EACTS and STS this year. The first question is to assess the size of the ascending aorta. If it is greater than 4.5 centimeters, the patient will require a frozen elephant trunk according to these guidelines. The second inflection point is to assess the presence of high-risk or complicated features. High-risk features can either be morphological or clinical. Complicated features include the presence of rupture, malperfusion syndrome, or uncontrollable hypertension and pain. High-risk high and complicated features will determine the timing of the intervention. For TVAR, as men mentioned earlier, um, some anatomical um, criteria need to be met. So the first one is sufficient iliac or femoral diameter for access. Then the, the aortic outer diameter um, needs to be taken into consideration, as well as the availability of a proximal and a distal landing zone. So our patient had a complicated type B dissection uh, with rupture and, and a, a large left-sided uh, hemothorax and was in extremis. Um, he went to our hybrid suite and underwent a, a emergent TVAR. This is his fluoroscopic image of uh, the catheter that was placed through his right femoral artery being advanced into the thoracic uh, uh, into the aortic arch past the dissection point. This was done under fluoroscopy as well as TEE guidance. Um, a 34 millimeter cook device was deployed um, under rapid pacing and uh, the left subclavian artery was intentionally uh, occluded. So this is a retrospective cohort from a single center and it showed that um, the incidence of uh, spinal cord ischemia is significantly higher in those patients that did not have surgical revascularization of their left subclavian artery, 10.7% versus 1.4%. However, there is no survival benefit um, in this cohort of revascularization or, um, or not, either by carotid subclavian bypass or fenestrated TVAR. Large databases have also supported this um, kind of finding that where possible um, 
revascularization of the left subclavian artery should be undertaken. This is the transesophageal short axis view of the descending um, thoracic um, aorta in our patient after the, the T-VAR stent was deployed. We can see flow in the true lumen within the stent and then clot formation um, in the false lumen with the dissection flap still present over there. So our patient uh, did well um, and did not, uh, did not um, develop any spinal cord ischemia. A 55-year-old female presented at our institution following a motor vehicle accident. Her CT showed a traumatic aortic injury at the level of the ligamentum arteriosum with pseudoaneurysm uh, formation. Classification of blunt thoracic aortic injuries are classified from grade 1 with an intimal tear and grade 4 being free rupture. This is a transesophageal four-chamber view showing normal biventricular function. Here we can see the aortic injury, the tear with a pseudo um, aneurysm formation, just distal to the left subclavian artery. She underwent a catheter-based intervention with deployment of a stent under fluoroscopy and uh, TEE guidance. Here the stent is deployed and this is scanning up a auto showing the stent in position. These patients are typically managed in a very similar fashion to type B dissection. A 68-year-old male with a STEMI, left main disease for cabbage, he's hypertensive, obese, OSA on CPAP. Four chamber view shows an enlarged RV. Scanning up his aorta pre-pump, he's got a normal looking aorta with some atherosclerotic disease. Post-pump. We notice a small interval flap just distal to the left subclavian artery. There was no extension. The patient had an emergent CT scan which confirmed the diagnosis of a small interval flap. These small interval flaps usually have a, a benign course um, and repeat screening CT scan on our patient um, showed no progression of the, the flap. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your time.